Well, uh, thank you very much. First of all, can you hear me okay? Yes? Okay. Yes, we can. And can you see my slide? Okay, so it's, a, it's my great pleasure to give a talk on a subject which is very dear to my heart, uh, sounding rockets and something I've been involved with uh, for over 40 years. And this was, uh, I was involved with rockets as a grad student at, with Mike Kelly at Cornell. And then I've been at NASA for over 35 years and I've continued work with rockets ever since. Now, um, I've, um, Going to try to give an overview of the rockets. I'm going to encourage questions. As it's a, it's a. Uh, I'm going to show results. Uh, actually, some are excerpts from a colloquium I gave at Goddard, which actually is available online about the science results. But I'm going to feature a lot of talk um, slides here at the beginning, really talking about what rockets are all about. So um, I'm going to talk about you know general features of the program, and uh, payload notes, launch locations. I'm going to emphasize the geophysics uh, uh, research in this talk. Uh, I have a slide at the end about our technology roadmap summary and also about a sounding rocket symposium, which we're going to have at Wallops that everyone's invited to, and that's August 17th. Uh, so my very last slide is about the symposium. So just in general, um, actually this is for over five, it's actually for over six decades, I got to change that. Uh, the rocket program has really been an essential part of NASA, uh, 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 part of its research and its uh, experiment uh, instrumentation development. It's uh, been with NASA since the start. Actually, we were launching rockets before NASA started in 1958, but it's it's been with the with the agency ever since the beginning, and it really rests on three sort of cut three elements. You know, the cutting edge science the testing of new technology and the education and training of students such as such as yourselves. Uh, and all three of those are important. And sometimes when I people ask me about the rocket program, they say, oh, that's just for testing new instruments or something like that. OK, that is a key feature. But really, it's the science that you can do with these with the rockets that is unique and is essential to understanding uh, the um, geospace and particularly the ionosphere thermosphere and now there's three important features of the program it's low cost it's rapid quick response you know you can do it you know within a it's usually a good phd topic and also the rockets do accept a higher amount of risk and that's that's very important uh although of course we never compromise safety so um the program itself is uh serves many different disciplines at nasa uh, astrophysics, planetary, solar, geospace, uh, not as much microgravity as we used to, but we used to have more microgravity payloads and also special projects such as aero braking for test. NASA wants to test so a landing system that they might use on Mars. They could do that and do do that using sounding rockets. So, you know, JPL sends stuff out and then, then we, do, um, we, we do special missions for them. But I'm going to be talking mostly about geospace here. But my these general comments really apply to apply to all disciplines. And I think a key aspect of the program is it's sort of a partner, not sort of, it is a partnership between three three parts. It's the principal investigator, that's the and his or her science team. You know, they they initiate it, they make it happen. But really, they do this in in conjunction with uh, Wallops and the Wallops flight facility is that where the Saudi rocket program office is and where the payloads are uh, designed and built and tested. It's not like they just send them off to some aerospace firm and, you know, on the other side of the country or something. No, they are all done locally. And it's sort of like the old skunk works, you know, programs and uh, of long ago, you know, it's all done right, right at Wallops. And also I must include, of course, NASA headquarters. And I say this, is so important because NASA headquarters is so much behind this program and they fund it and they're involved and they are, you know, an extremely important part of this partnership. Now, I also though, and I, I, I put this as a special part of this slide because I sometimes I forget to emphasize that the contracted workforce at Wallops is, uh, 
are contractors and that so we do have an industry component you know people think it's just civil service no 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 the contractor workforce at wallops is called nasrock in fact they're really the ones who who you know build and design and test and get everything together and they're managed by the rocket program office but that in industrial industry uh component is just an essential part of the nasa's rocket program so um uh just to talk about some from some features here i've got some slides now about general remarks and there's a lot of words on them but they're all important i really should and um i just want to emphasize a few things one is that the the pi is firmly in charge of the mission the pi uh proposes the mission and then takes it from you know from the proposal all the way to the data analysis and the publications and so and it's not just the the pi is simply some little piece of a cog in the wheel it, it's really is uh a, a, i think a feature of the program is it's led by um uh, led by a pi and that pi i think it's, it's also, i think that's actually a very appealing part of the program to, to scientists and uh you know the pi must work within an agreed upon science budget no contingency uh must stay within this envelope and it's really excellent real world training for the pi i have another another few comments on this on this later now um uh, i just want to emphasize that all the missions at least the ones that are funded by nasa the science mission director are based on peer review proposals and uh they generally I, I, I first said all, but there, there could be some exception, but they all focus on some science question, you know, and that's, you know, the ones that get selected are after some new science. Um, I guess if there was some instrument development that was so compelling, sure, that could be a reason to be accepted. But in general, they all solve or focus on an important science question and, and particularly ones that can only be, uh, solved with data gathered on sounding rockets you know if you write a proposal and somebody says why don't you just use i don't know icon data or something you know that's you're, you're not going to be win but if you say hey this can only be done with rockets and this is the reasons why you know that's that uh helps get you selected so as i said earlier the program accepts a higher risk posture uh the overall perf program performance metric is 85 percent we do better than that, but that's really what the aim is. You know, so we do accept uh, uh, a probability of, of um, failure, I guess, is, is somewhat higher. Um, although we always try to make sure everything everything works. Don't don't worry. But this is this is, I think, a key part of the program, and just emphasize that safety is never compromised. Now, new instrumentation development is encouraged. You don't have to just propose something that has to have instruments that have flown before, and that's the only way you're going to get selected no not at all yeah, often missions and tell them uh, well they new instrumentation is encouraged frequently missions entail but a mix of standard well-proven instrumentation and new instruments and that's usually just because you want to if you want to make some make sure you have some minimum success for you you've got to get some particular measurement you might have some well-proven way to do that on your payload and also maybe a brand new way of doing that then you can pair them so that's that's frequently what what's flown but if you have all new instruments and that's their sound and, and makes sense you know this this is the platform for you uh, often rocket missions involve more than one rocket or more than one payload such as you might have two at once one going high one going low two different azimuths or you might have a salvo where you launch some and then if uh, later you launch another or maybe one on one day and one on another day for a different geophysical conditions and that's not unusual that's fine but those are all part of one investigation you propose an investigation to nasa headquarters and you might say hey i need two rockets or i need this or that's so many payloads that's that's good but they're all part of one overall investigation now uh some more words here this is important it's i just try to hit the highlights here the um Generally, NASA geospace missions encompass three years of work. That's from, uh, you know, includes the launch and the data analysis. Usually you're launching your third year. There may be ways to do this in less than two, and particularly, and I'll, I'll come to that in a few bullets. But in general, it's about a three-year effort. And also proposals always include the complete mission. 
that includes instruments, ground-based support, data analysis, field work, travel, et cetera. You know, so you, you, the whole thing is in one, one budget. And the PIs expected to solve problems within their budget. You know, they, you know, they have a problem. They're not, you know, headquarters doesn't want you to come whining and say, hey, you know, some, I need another 10K to cover this or that. It just doesn't work. You're, you, we say there's no contingency, and that's true, but the PI usually reserves some budget if something out of the ordinary comes up. And, you know, if there is something incredibly major that happens that you need to get some more funding, it's, it's not impossible, but it's, it's hard to get. And you're not, it's not um, expected. Um, and then I said, some missions could be done in two years, particularly if there's like some key event, like a solar eclipse or something that you say, hey, I just got to get this rocket and you make a compelling case or mission is very straightforward, say it's just vapor trails or something. Or actually in the astronomy, when we had the, um, uh, there was a supernova and uh, hey, you know, we obviously missed, well, obviously we missed the supernova, but the astronomers wanted to get the, at the aftermath as soon as possible. And I think they launched in less than one year. And uh, usually with the astro missions, they have recovered payloads. So they're able to, uh, able to do that. Okay. Now, by the way, recovery, uh, in general, geospace missions do not re include recovery, and they rarely require recovery for success. Um, I, having said that, with the UR satellite, there was one experimenter named Ed Ziff from Pittsburgh who actually launched rockets that gathered, physically gathered the gas in the middle atmosphere, and uh, he had to recover that because he then analyzed it in his lab, and he had 24 flights under UR's. And uh, he took he took captured the gas at every like 20 kilometers, like 20 kilometers, 40 kilometers, 60 kilometers. We we got the um, canisters back and he analyzed them. So there's a case where you've got to recover for success. But in general, recovery is nice. It's not usually not needed, and uh, it really only makes sense if you if it's really not if you need to get the instruments back or something that's but it has, really has to be cost effective. There's always extra operations. And I wouldn't think there is, recovery is possible, but it's, I wouldn't think about it as, some, as, as standard for geospace. It's, it's, you know, what, we have land recovery, that's at White Sands or Poker Flat, or also water recovery, say from Wallops, Wajlan or Peru. And that's only if the apogee isn't like way out in the Arctic Ocean or something. You know, like it's, it's just a common recovery. Okay, now um, I'm now just going to uh, show you. These are some sounding rocket vehicles. This is a rather old slide, but it's still quite pertinent. And uh, we have different uh, vehicles, and, and uh, frequently they're made up of military surplus vehicles. That's the, like the Nike Orion, the Orion, the Terry Orion. Those are all um, surplus vehicles. You know, we Wallace puts on the fins, does the analysis. You know, Etz rays the motors, make sure they're fine. But uh, we also have very high flying rockets. I'll show you a slide in a second with the apexes, such as the Black Brat 12, uh, the Black Brat 9 over here on the right, uh, that's, uh, that's really a standard workhorse. And what is, you know, the, this could be a Black Brat as the first stage and a Terrier for the second stage, something like that. Okay, so here's sort of the, the current, what we call the stable, the stable of rockets. And uh, this is, um, uh, you know, all the different types and people say, well, why do you have so many? And the reason is we go to different apogees depending on the science. And the apogee is determined by the mass of your payload and some payloads are heavier than others. If you only want to go to the um, mesosphere, you, you use a different rocket. So I'm now going to show you, here are the performance of the rockets I, in the stable I just showed you. And each line is sort of their apogee versus mass. You see the, the, the payload weight is on the bottom. So there's different classes, but you can sort of see that if you want to just go to um, the lower ionosphere, you don't need a Black Brant 12 for that. In fact, you wouldn't want a Black Brant 12 for that. But a Terry Orion would be very nice, you know. And this is for the, these tip, these are typical payload weights. Um, if you've got a light payload, only want to go to 90 kilometers, you might just use a, an Orion. Um, and then this Black Brant 9 is sort of the one that gives this, this region here around 400 kilometers. Those are typically used by the astronomers and the solar payloads. Um, and then the Black Brant 11s, 12s, and Oriole Brants, and 
things like that, though, that go really high if you have to be acceleration physics or other things, you'd use those, those um, rockets. Now you're probably wondering, gee, do I have to learn all about the rockets? And the answer is no, the wallops will take care of that. You know, it's, it's good to know about the rocket. You can speak knowledgeably about Terrier Brants and this and that, uh, you know, around the Thanksgiving table or something. But in reality, uh, you just have to tell wallops how high you want to go. And they will, they will assign a rocket to you. In fact, you're, you know, usually you can suggest, you can say, I think this is typical for like a Black Brant 9, but it's, it's up to wallops to who actually uh, makes that decision. And in fact, uh, there's now a new commercial suborbital program for a middle atmosphere. I have a slide on that later, which we, we are encouraging uh, researchers to look into. And that's a totally new uh, types of rockets, particularly with um, ones that are piloted, for example. And uh, that's not on this chart, but I'll come to that in a second. Okay. So the actual flight performance is just a key part of the, any experiment because you have to know, you, you want to say how high you want to go. And you might like on this experiment, this is from our dynamo experiment that I'm going to be talking about tomorrow morning, by the way, in the morning. Um, you know, we said we want to get to 135 kilometers. So this, this um, graph here on the upper right is altitude versus time. So we said we want to get to 135. But these are unguided. You know, the rocket is going to have a two sigma high and a two sigma low. You can see here that two sigma low is about 120 and two sigma high is about 150. Now, you have to be able to live within your range. And if you, you're you going to write, say, a mission success, and you're going to say, I've got to have at least 120 or I, I fail. I, I'll miss my, my science. And then, so then if you said, okay, 135 is your nominal, 120 is your minimum, and that you got to make sure the two sigma low it will get you your minimum. So this is something you work out with wallets, but it's just want to emphasize that the wallets have, the, sorry, the rockets have some dispersion, the dispersion in the altitude and also the range. The range is shown on the bottom. And uh, one, I don't have a slide on this, but the azimuth is very important. Like at wallets, you really can only launch, you know, southeast and, uh, you know, you want to be able to hit if you have to hit a region, you've got to be able to fit inside various dispersion circles. But all of this is is very uh, is key. I mean, very straightforward. Now, actually, here on the left, I just emphasize. I should do this in color. But the bottom two parts here's your rocket. And these bottom two parts are the boners, and then the payloads on top. So now I'm going to show you what the payload's all about, because usually that's what the experimenters most interested in. And this is our payload from our Dynamo rockets. Uh, that were launched last July, actually Dynamo 2, they, they were launched on July 7th and on July 11th. And so at the very bottom, you can see how everything sort of fits in, you know, inside the skin, how you have your instruments. And um, then this, the, these, the different sections are shown here. This particular uh, mission or payload uh, investigation included many sub payloads. Like the top payload here was, um, or the small electric field sphere, we call it the Maynard sphere. That was shown, that was in the forward section under the nose cone. You can see how it's folded up down here at the bottom. Then we had the main payload. And when that uh, skin came off, we had these booms come out, gave us five meters to tip electric field booms. And we had Langmuir probes and other things to measure plasma density and magnetometers. And then the University of New Hampshire, uh, Jim Clemens had instruments on another sub payload right here, and uh, that was this section. And you might say, well, why do you need all these sub payloads? Well, in the case of the electric fields, we wanted to have one, uh, because we're trying to measure very precise electric fields and have a magnetometer on that, we wanted to disturb the medium to the least extent. So we had the spherical payload that has been developed over the years at Goddard. Uh, the main payload, we had electric fields come out that could be longer and have higher uh, telemetry and also get a two-point measurement and to do interferometry and other things like that. And it also had uh, uh, you know, other, uh, other instruments as well, as well. Now, the UNH payload could have stayed with the main payload, except the UNH payload didn't want to spin. And the electric field experiment with the magnetometer does want to spin. So... This one is, you know, spinning happily. And if these instruments on the uh, UNH that are looking at the neutral wind and the neutral density, 
they don't want to spin. So they could either spin and just get data once per spin. That's how sometimes it works. But in this case, we gave UNH their own sub payload with their own attitude control system. So whereas these payloads were spinning, the UNH payload remained with their instrument shown here in the RAM direction the entire flight. And uh, by the way, the entire flight is you know five minutes. So, but it's it's a great five minutes, and it's five minutes going slowly in just the medium you want. The satellites, you know, go at eight kilometers a second. The rockets go at one kilometer a second or, or less, and that's very important for a lot of the missions. Now, here's just a picture of some of the hardware from when I just showed you. These um, over here on the right is the spherical payload with the electric field booms deployed. Uh, on the left is the uh, Actually, the five meter tip to tip booms on the main payload still still attached to the, uh, the skin here with the Langmuir probe. On the bottom is the UNH uh, winds mass spectrometer neutral density payload. This is all during testing, of course, but you can get a sense of what the what the um, instruments might look like, what their size is. Typical diameters of payloads are like 17 inches. Uh, so there's others that are smaller, 12, and you can also have very small payloads. Uh, as pioneered by you know, Christina Lynch and Mark Lassard and others, uh, Chuck Swenson, the CubeSat type payloads. We'll go into that later. Okay, so you might think, well, how do I get started? How do I do all this? Well, Wallops is there to help. Wallops job is to provide all of the basic payload design and subsystems. The experimenter just shows up with the uh, experiment essentially, but they have meetings, they have requirements and you ask, gee, I'm not a, look in this direction, I got to spin in this direction. And there's a whole infrastructure there to help. In fact, someone who's never done it before is, is you know, they roll out the red carpet. And next thing you know, you know, they provide you with power, you know, you need so many volts, so much current, you know, they solve, help you solve these problems. You have to sort of know, obviously with your experiment, how much power you need and what voltage and this and that, how to do the telemetry. But if you're new to the game, they you know, Wallops is there to help. That's very, very important. So on the left here, you can see all the things they, they do. They do, you know, mechanical uh, engineering. They provide the power. They provide telemetry and timers. They um, attitude control, and recovery subsystems, so um, and trajectory. Now, where do we launch? Uh, actually, I'm, I'm worried I'm going to run out of time here. So let me just show you. These are all the launch sites used by NASA. Um, uh, you know, we have fit sites such as Wallops, White Sands, and Poker. We have what we call foreign fit, Sweden and Norway. And then we have mobile, like Australia, Peru, Puerto Rico. This, you know, these are the ones at least have been used in the last 30 years. Uh, now, I it's a very important slide. I want to just emphasize there's a new initiative at NASA. It's not part of the science mission directorate. It's part of the science space technology mission directorate, STMD that's promoting uh, commercial um, suborbital flight opportunities. There's a, a pamphlet on this, here's the website. And essentially these are some of your um, things like, you know, um, Blue Origin and, and, and UP Aerospace and others. And this is, you know, some, and this is a way, another way to get into space. And right now they, these missions can go up to about 100 kilometers or so. And, uh, you know, if, if this is a, if your science can use this, then you should, because this is a opportunity, which is the agency is investing in and is providing. But in general, everything I'm talking about though is sort of the traditional rockets. But again, if you can, if you can uh, sort of partner with one of these uh, opportunities, then that's, that's good. Now, I'm, again, I'm worried I'm, I don't have enough time. So I'm just gonna talk a little bit about the dis disciplines I'm gonna, quickly show you a slide or two on astro solar payloads and why, then I'm gonna talk about geospace. With astronomy payloads and solar payloads, the goal is to get above the Earth's atmosphere because you wanna avoid the attenuation effects. Otherwise, you just look at, look at your, um, do your experiment from the ground. The reason you need a rocket is to get above the atmosphere that absorbs various wavelengths like UV and X-rays and those, those features have all, those rockets have a fine pointing and, you know, they have real time joystick uplink commands and things like that. Don't really have time to go into that. 
but that's a key feature of the program. Here's just an example of how uh, Paul Fellman looked at the comet Hale-Bopp. There's all sorts of stories behind, made all sorts of discoveries. And that was also a quick turnaround. Uh, solar payloads that had all sorts of new instrumentation that were later flown on sounding rockets. Uh, here's a, an example of one by Tom Woods of flying underneath timed the sea experiment, also SDO to, to calibrate the, uh, the um, uh, you know, the EUV instrument. And to do that, he had several instruments and you actually see the degradation of, the, of his timed instrument. So this is, this is a great thing in the rockets. You know, you can also do things in conjunction with satellites. Now with the with uh, geospace, uh, here are some of the features, you know, it's, they can go uh, at the low altitudes that you just can't do with a satellite to get direct measurements. That's gotta be your number one thing. Uh, they also provide vertical profiles, slow vehicle speeds. You can launch into geophysical events. You can take them to, to remote sites. You can launch in conjunction with ground-based. You can align the payload in various orientations. Uh, you can have small payloads to minimize perturbations and much smaller than a satellite, except now we have the CubeSats. And multiple payloads, uh, simultaneous launches. You can have vapor trails, launch in conjunction with satellites and, and uh, have tethered capabilities. Now, I've got some science examples. I'm gonna take about five minutes. I, if I can go a little over, I, I'd appreciate that. I wanna just try if that would be acceptable. Uh, the big thing with rockets, just someone has to scream at me and say stop, but otherwise if I could have a little more time here. Uh, most importantly with the Aurora, the early rockets, the Aurora see at the bottom here, you know, discovered that the source of the Aurora light was KEV electron. And you might think, great, that that's solved. But the real problem is, not problem, the real quest is what's accelerating those electron beams. And as a result, you know, we started having a whole new initiative with higher apogee rockets. This came out of the Berkeley group with Chuck Carlson. And, you know, by sort of going away from the collision dominated regime to the higher altitudes, all sorts of new physics was discovered. And uh, this then laid, uh, really, this is the, why we had the Black Brent 12 and just a tremendous accomplishment. And also this led the way to the fast satellite, the rockets were the springboard, not just for the science, but also the top hat detectors and electric field double probes, everything was developed on sounding rockets. And also the PI himself, Chuck Carlson, had all this experience with rockets and he just put that into fast. And that's why fast was such a great success. Uh, here's, you know, the Berkeley group had two rockets at the same time, looking at the difference between the high altitude and the low. I'm just gonna have to go very quickly here. Uh, other researchers, Mark Lassard had one with, and uh, all sorts of very small little uh, payloads and that, you know, able, and this is also the work of um, Christina Lynch and others, you know, permitting curl of beam measurements of the current and, you know, really being able to get an array of instruments. And this is a just tremendous uh, experiment. I just don't have time to go into it now. I actually, there's a movie here, which I'm not gonna take the time. Um, uh, we, uh, rockets offer very high telemetry. In fact, Jim LaBelle just pioneered by looking at the HF regime with high telemetry, he sees all these new features, such as these structured Langmuir waves and various cutoffs. And so this uh, um, is something which is really uh, um, you know, fundamental in nature. We didn't know about until we had the high telemetry routinely. We took rockets to the cusp, but we recently finished uh, the Grand Challenge Initiative led by Doug Rowland. This was one of our earlier rockets from the cusp where we our experiment was look at the difference between open and closed field lines on the on the um, electric fields and the plasma velocities. You can see that in the lower left, and also how the cusp is so structured, it's structured inside the cusp as opposed to outside the cusp. So that was part of that that study that really opened up the the Nee Allison uh, launch range. Um, we had our first what we call tailored trajectory. This was the work done by Mark Conding, John Craven, Gene Westcott where they actually launched from poker flat. And then after the second stage, they turned the rocket and went horizontal and um, got horizontal winds because they wanted to measure, uh, get a horizontal profile. What was saying has rockets are so great for um, vertical profiles. And though the a satellite can give you a horizontal profile, but not at these low altitudes. And this is so important. So this is, uh, 
Oh, these for, uh, these Taylor trajectories is something new. They're very they're very exciting. Uh, Mike Kelly launched rockets over thunderstorms, and he showed he had two at once. He showed just how much DC coupled electric fields penetrate into the ionosphere. That's a whole new 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 aspect of nature. You know, we usually think of just whistlers and things associated with uh, thunderstorms in the ionosphere. Well, there's, there's DC coupled electric fields as well. Um, we had our campaign in Brazil, and uh, this was the Guarar campaign. And, uh, you know, we looked at the electric jet going eastward, we, the spread F going eastward, saw these, uh, um, a lot of neutral uh, turbulence, gravity wave breaking, it was a huge success. Um, uh, Dave Heisel took a rocket to Kwajalein, there's been others too, Erhan Kadecki in particular, but he noticed he, everyone flies in spread F when it's the most, uh, when it's strongest. He, he launched at the onset because he wanted to see what was, what was seeding the spread F. And he saw this big shear in the electric fields right at the base of the uh, uh, F region. And, and saying, no, that's, that's why we get spread F. It's from the shear. Um, Dick Goldberg launched a not to loosen clouds. And we, here's measurements of our electric fields showing uh, you know, structure. These are the source of the PMSE echoes, you know, and the um, uh, not to loosen clouds, you know, dusty plasma aerosols. It's fascinating physics. You can only do this in, with direct measurements with, uh, with sounding rockets. Um, and then finally, just wrapping up now, we had the vapor trails, all this pioneered by Miguel Larson in particular. You know, he, it's, it's just been incredible. If, if all the models show the wind should be weak, Larson put together all of the wind data from the trails. You see that on the left. And it's just much stronger, much, much larger than what's uh, um, predicted by the models. You know, there's all sorts of talk about, you know, or evidence for uh, sort of a jet atmosphere, upper atmospheric jet stream and NRL track shuttle exhaust products, you know, going to other hemispheres in very short times. There has to be some very strong winds there. And really this was all sort of pioneered with um, the knowledge we have is, is, is essentially from sounding box. I think the icon Mighty data is really a great example of how we finally getting some of this from, from uh, satellites. But still, the uh, details from the rockets are uh, essential for our understanding. And then my final example here is from uh, Mark Conde, his cusp region experiment, where he had 16 canisters of different vapor trails. You can see them here. This was the, you know, they, he can, they can track these and then get the uh, motions of the winds and the plasma. You see the aurora in the background. So this is the type of things you can do with these multiple satellites. We have a technology roadmap that's to do new things, high altitude, small mesospheric. Won't go into this now, I just need to wrap up. I will say in, my, in summary that here I have the six decades. No, the program has just been an essential part of NASA and it's really for the science community. It's I think something which everyone should feel is, um, is a great tool, great asset. It's, it serves many different disciplines. It's, fed, it's ideal for geospace. And again, the, my three takeaways, unique platforms, particularly for gathering data in regions that are un unaccessible to satellites. Uh, they're great for developing new instruments. They're excellent means to train scientists and engineers, you know, firsthand experience with hardware, mission management, data analysis. And on my very first campaign in 1979, my advisor, Mike Kelly, turned to me. And we, after the, after, when the rocket was in the air, the rocket was launched, and he said, this is a great way to make a living. And so with that, I'd like to conclude and ask if you have any questions. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Fluff, for the wonderful talk. So uh, because of time limited, our limited time, uh, we will only take one question. Uh, if you could please bring up the slide. Um, we also invited Dr. Fluff for student lunch tomorrow. So yes. if you, uh, and then he will be able to take uh, other questions during the student lunch. So please come if you're interested to hear more stories from, from him. So the question would be, have you launched more than one sounding rocket simultaneously? If yes, then how more than one launch add to the scientific studies? 
Okay, well, we've we've launched a high altitude and a low altitude rocket simultaneously. Our our Royal Jets rockets did that from um, Poker Flat, and we were trying to. Our goal was to understand how did the uh, 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 currents close between the high altitude and the low altitude over an auroral arc, and also how do the winds change uh, as a, between the high altitude and the low altitude. Uh, so yes, we, we've done that. Many others have done that also. Cool. Uh, so I hope everyone has enjoyed this first half of our student day uh, without starving. Uh, and we will take a two hour lunch break and we will return at 1.45 p.m. Just one more reminder that please bring your laptop back here for the hands-on section. And uh, we have two demo calls ready for the afternoon talk. Uh, it will be posted uh, on the agenda and I will also send you a reminder email. All right, okay. thank you. Thank you, Dr. Buck.